Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, Suzanne Worthley, who's here to share with us her new book, Confident Empath, a complete guide to multidimensional empathing and energetic protection. So do you think you're empath and you've had problems with energetic self-care, healing energetically, self-protection practices, and creating a life filled with empowerment? Well, today, Suzanne's here to share with us just that. Suzanne Worthley is an energy healing practitioner and intuitive who has focused on death and dying for 20 years. She has played a vital role in partnerships with families and hospice teams, helping the dying to have a peaceful transition and helping family members and caregivers understand what is happening energetically during the death process. So welcome to the show, Suzanne Worthley. Thank you for having me. What an honor it is to have you here and to talk about this book. What inspired you to write this? Oh boy, Um, besides being a full empath myself and struggling for many, many years because way back when this was kind of not really a hot subject, amazingly right now, it seems to be quite a buzzword out there, the word empath, and yet being a practitioner that deals with this all day long in terms of energy, I found that um, a lot of people were confusing the concept of what empathy is versus empathing. And I really wanted to get the message out there that these were really two distinctly different things and that the latter empathing can be really a detriment to our health and our wellness. So that's really kind of what prompted it, you know, both being one and working with them all day long. So when you talk about confident empath, what does that mean? Well, empathing is a birthright of being human. I mean, we're designed as a human body to feel one another, to you know, relate to one another, to walk in somebody else's shoes. And so empathy is a beautiful and wonderful experience of oneness. That said, when we empath, we don't just walk in the other person's shoes. We, I I kind of say it like we basically steal their shoes. We keep their shoes. We take their shoes and make them our own. And so oftentimes, instead of just holding space for someone who has pain or sadness or sickness, we're taking that into our field, which then in turn creates a dis-ease or a dis imbalance in my field. And then my health and wellness is at jeopardy. So it's a really big difference. And I just really wanted to get that message out there for people so they know. With impasse, is it something that they tend to feel like they need to carry everyone's weight? Or is it just something they need to learn in how not to carry the weight of other people? Yeah, most often it's the first in terms of I start this book out with the very first chapter about belief systems. And most all of us do grow up with a belief system that everyone else comes first because we're taught that, you know, gosh, if I put myself first, I'm selfish. And so we have kind of twisted that word. And I I bring this from the perspective of self-love. It's important for us to take ourselves first in terms of energy and balance and harmony. And then we can look at taking everybody else's stuff on. It kind of has a whole different fuel behind it if you want to look at it that way. Well, and is it appropriate for us as empaths to take on other people's energies? Why would we do that? Yeah, I mean, it really is not technically appropriate in terms of a whole lot of things. It does not honor that person's, say, journey. It doesn't honor that person's even sickness or struggles. Um, But we have this tendency to think that I can help you, which indeed I can hold space for you. I can be there for you and support you. But when I want to help you to the extent of I want to take it to fix it, This is when we cross that line. And oftentimes we don't even know we're doing it. Most of the people that I have in my office as an energy practitioner, when they're starting out their journey, don't even realize they're an empath. They're just exhausted and they're sick and they're resentful and there's not a moment in the day. And so there's a lot of indicators in this book that, you know, you might want to test yourself with to say, gosh, yeah, I do that. I put myself last. Everyone else comes first, et cetera. So it's it's something that some people are aware of and others don't even have a clue. So are there specific qualities that empaths typically have? Because I know you've gone over a couple. Are there other ones we should look at? Yeah, most definitely the biggest red flag indicator is your health and your own wellness, your sense of anxiety or stress, your um, you know, exhaustion level, your actual sickness level. 
Um, it's the person that makes lists and then makes lists for their lists and yet never gets to the list because they're too busy getting to the list and on it goes, you know? So it's kind of like this cycle of just go, 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 do, 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 do. And we tend to forget that we are designed to be a human being and we are created as human doings in this society and get validated for it. So, you know, and, and worry, 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 worry. This is a huge indicator for an empath when we worry about everyone and everything, and it takes a hit on our health and our wellness. So when we look at empaths, is there just one type of empath or is there many different types? Yeah. Thanks for asking that one. I designate three in this book. Um, generally speaking, every single working person walking this planet is an empath to some extent, because this is again, how the body is designed to feel what others feel. So what we would designate as a general empath is someone that's just probably about, you know, 80% of the humans walking around the planet. We empath, we feel I'm overwhelmed. I'm in a big audience at a concert and I'm kind of feeling stressed, or I'm at a family party with, you know, so-and-so, and I'm not feeling really great. I have anxiety, et cetera. Generally speaking, the general empath will have the experience, but it will very quickly and very easily just kind of move through their system. They won't be affected long-term. The second category, however, is what we call the sensitive empath. These are the people that are much more sensitive to the energies. I cannot tolerate that level of sound and music. There's too many people at this party. I'm feeling very claustrophobic and scared and my breathing patterns are changing. I can feel all kinds of things that aren't mine and so on and so on. This is generally speaking what most of the empaths fall into. But then that third category is a bump up even more, which is called a psychic sensitive empath. That's what I am. And these are the people that can feel energies that are coming from spaces and places that others don't even recognize as here or real, meaning I can pick up paranormal energies, spirit energies, ghost energies, off-planet energies. I can pick it up from the trees and the land and a building and on and on it goes. So this is a really big one because we take it on from absolutely everywhere and everything. And so this particular book I wrote from that multidimensional aspect because I, I didn't find a lot of information out there when I was struggling with this. And so the more I learned about the multidimensional aspects of empathing, the more critical my work became. I was very impressed in your book. You show examples of how to practice empathy-based responses. And I, I would think that that would be really difficult for people sometimes that are so used to trying to fix things to how <laughs> they can relanguage. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and words. Words are so amazing. I watch that a lot as a practitioner. When I have a client come into my office, I'm watching as much as I'm listening and our words create our beliefs, which then create our reality. And we will use words like have to, need to, can't, should. All of these kinds of words are the empath words. I have to go do this. I can't do this. I should do this. And the language in and of itself is very difficult. So catching ourselves in the language communication and responses is really part of this learned skill. It's part of being present. It's part of feeling what that feels like when that verbiage comes out of my mouth so that I'm realizing, oh gosh, I just lost energy or, oh my goodness, I just gained energy. So the, this being present is really something that's very important to this kind of a situation. So what does the connection look like that's between a uh, uh, someone who's an empath, their beliefs and their behaviors? Well, oh, the worry one is a great one. You know, we will we will have beliefs that that say, gosh, I have to take care of you. I have to be there for you. I have to fix you. So many of my um, middle-aged client women are worried about their children. You know, my child's off at college and I'm so worried about him or her and they're driving back and forth and it's going to be dangerous. And all of these things are are belief systems that that feel somehow inside of me as the empath that I can fix this or I should fix this so that they don't struggle. And these are creating really patterns within families also, because oftentimes we'll hand this down from grandma to mom to daughter or grandfather to father to son. Um, it's not a male female thing, but I do have to admit most of my empaths that I work with are women. And this is a learned belief system that will be in the family structure or the society structure or the religious structure or the educational structure. So it's it, they all combine together. When we think we have to worry, 
then we're creating quite a mess for everybody. And I'm actually not doing anything. I'm really not changing someone's reality by me worrying. I'm actually causing stress and disease to myself. So these are just learned beliefs that we can indeed change once we're recognizing and aware of them. I've often heard of empaths and people that are gifted that I know talk about how they have this deep sense of longing or they feel like there's something that's missing in their life. Is this a common thing? I think when I hear those words, um, that reminds me a little bit more of what we would call the star seed or the psychic being or person on the earth that has had other feelings of be longing, be longing elsewhere. Um, oftentimes looking at the stars, oftentimes wondering where I come from, where I really belong to. Uh, we will kind of use that phrase, a star seed for that. That seems to be very popular right now, which by the way, is another thing that I am. So oftentimes my clients end up being star seeds. So this longing to connect, this longing to yearn can be very unfulfilling, un, you know, confusing, not understanding it if you're a star seed. If we take that down a level to a regular empath, to like a psychic empath or a sensitive empath, this can be like, I, I'm, I'm yearning for something, but what that yearning for is a connection. It's a connection to oneness. And we're all very disconnected in terms of energy. We really don't know how to do oneness with no conditions attached. This is when the empath learns to do things differently. I can hold space for you. I can pray for you. I can cheerlead you. I can be there for you, but I'm not going to take from you. I'm not going to take that energy from you. So we can learn to do our longings and our feelings of separation differently once we're educated in this field. So I know in your book, you talk about several different uh, topics. One is poverty consciousness. And I'd love for you to share with us why this is something that we should look at or even pay attention to. Yeah, gosh, this is a big one for so many, myself included. Um, you know, so many of us are so confused about what makes us safe. And when we're talking about energy, the triad of energy triggers, in my opinion, are being safe, feeling there's enough, feeling that we are safe, and feeling that I have self worth and self love. And the enough part directly relates to poverty consciousness. Now, poverty consciousness doesn't have to like rely um, or surround itself with money issues. However, so many of us on this planet are worried about money. I don't have enough. I don't have enough money to buy this. I don't have enough money to buy that. I don't have a big enough house. I don't have a you know great enough job and so forth. So when we have money issues, it will kick up or trigger our poverty consciousness. When poverty consciousness is then triggered, what happens to the empath is I trigger with, I'm not enough. I'm not enough. Me as a person, my skills, my abilities, my love, my quotient, my everything, I'm not enough. So poverty consciousness goes super deep in the empath. When I don't feel I'm enough, I'm going to go overboard, above and beyond, out of my circle, constantly trying to prove to the world that I'm enough. And so I'm outside validating instead of inside validating, if that makes sense. Yes, that does. That makes perfect sense. And thank you for taking the time to go through that. And it's interesting. You talk about energy in your book and you share about chakras and, and go on. But one thing I want to kind of hone in on is the energy transference. And I think a lot of times people are just unaware of how that works. Oh, yeah, that is the literal that's the basis of being an empath. So the way that I describe it, when I'm talking about all the things like our energy fields, when I'm talking about things like your aura and your chakras, those are, you know, kind of not everybody in the world understands that. So I kind of brought it down to something very simplistic. Our human body is like a vehicle. We're a vehicle of God's source. Whatever your God package looks like for you, that's great. But in terms of the energy, I'm a vehicle of that source. I'm a human vehicle. A vehicle needs gasoline. The gasoline is our consciousness connection to source energy. So it's just like my vehicle needs to connect to that source energy vehicle. And this happens via my chakras. Now, what's even more important, however, is the next step for the empath, which is the gas tank. I can have the greatest car, the greatest parts, the greatest gas. But if I don't have a tank that's in good shape, I'm going to fill that vehicle with gas and it's going to spill out all over the ground at the station. And then I don't understand why I'm not flying down the road with ease and grace, right? So 
this vehicle has to have that gas tank, that bubble. We call it a bubble or um, an egg. There's a lot of different words they use for the auric fields. If that egg or that bubble is in poor shape, I will come across someone else or something else. And these holes are in there and I will need my gasoline. So I will steal someone else's gasoline. I will merge into their egg or their bubble to take their energy so that I can fuel myself. And this usually happens both ways. They allow it, the person allows it, or the thing allows it. So we're calling this a transference of energy. This is not a great thing to do because it's kind of like a Red Bull. I get a great hit at first. I feel good. Wow, wow. And then boom, I flatten out again. And so I have to find it again and again. And this is why energy transference turns into what we call psychic vampiring or energy vampiring because I need more and I need more and I need more. So the confident empath learns the structure of the vehicle, the gasoline connection, but mostly the tank and takes care of its own tank first and then fuels itself first so that this transference isn't going on all day long because it's a roller coaster ride that will wear your parts right out. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Suzanne Worthley in regards to her new book, Confident Empath, a complete guide to multidimensional empathing and energetic protection. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. The first thing you need to know about me is that I love my kids but they are not my everything. They used to be, but that's when my entire life fell apart. In order to pick back up the pieces, I had to put the love I have for myself before everything else, including my kids. I'm Jessica Dennehy, and I own multiple businesses. I'm a best-selling author, and I have all the strategies that I've used to make my life what it is today. And I'm gonna teach you how to do them in my new book, Selfish is a Superpower. So go get your copy today on Barnes & Noble or jessicadennehy.com. Announcing a revolutionary tool for wellness, Scalar Light has the ability to enhance and harmonize your own bio energies. With Scalar Light, you can get started in just minutes and begin feeling better the very next day. Scalar Light is a remote energy that gently and subtly works with your own body's bio energies, increases pro cellular wellness, and enhances your body's immunity. Experience the benefits of Scalar Light. Try a complimentary 15 day experience at scalarlight.com. In your hands lie ancestral patterns. These patterns shape how you think, what you struggle with, and experiences you love, your life pattern. We're going into the latest neuroscience of biological hand analysis, a realm beyond palmistry where science and the soul entwine. Hand analysis is the latest method to transform lifelong patterns. I am Master Hand Analyst Brent Bruning. Join us and visit thepowerinyourhands.com. Looking for a page turner? Cozy up to a fantasy adventure romance trilogy with The Girl in the Twall Wallpaper by Mary Kay Savarese. The second novel in the Star Writers trilogy, The Star Writers Club, is coming soon. Take the journey. Connect with Mary at www.marykaysavarese.com. Her books are available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie bookstores. The book Terminal Cancer is a Misdiagnosis, authored by Danny Carroll, is on sale at Amazon now. Licensed psychologist and psychotherapist Tessa Antia John Guerra commented, This is one of the most empowering books on a topic of cancer you will ever read. Award-winning author T.L. Needham commented, This recommended book can be understood by anyone seeking answers, hope, and alternatives to a terminal diagnosis. Buy it now on Amazon.com. With Breath Hub, you'll experience the transformative power of breath as it harmonizes your body, mind, and spirit. Recommended by experts in fitness, sports, psychology, and medicine. Meet the scientific way of being well. Breath Hub. Breathe better. Live better. Pandemonium. 
Fast forward 20 years. A U.S. president seizes control of all U.S. missiles, the power grid, the banking system, and every computer in America as he hides in an underground bunker. Pandemonium, a captivating sci-fi thriller where a hidden war, psychics, aliens, artificial intelligence, and transcendental love collide with the latest media technology. Pandemonium, live to all devices. Get your copy on paperback or digital. Free sample at getpsychic.org. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guest Suzanne Worthley in regards to her new book, Confident Empath, a complete guide to multidimensional empathing and energetic protection. So before we left for break, we were talking about, I think in many ways people understand as energy vampires or the transfer of energy from one person to another and how that works. I know we've all been around people that after we spend some time with them later on, we feel like we are so completely drained of our energy. Maybe we can't even really walk. We feel like we just have to go to bed for the rest of the day. What's interesting to me is that you talk about this in a way that I found very enlightening. You talk about how we have personal responsibility when it comes to this energy exchange. Can you share on that for our listeners? Oh, that's my favorite line of the whole time we've been chatting, because this is what I really, really stress with people. This is a personal responsibility. It is our job to fuel ourselves first. And this is where, especially we women, gosh forbid, if we're mothers and daughters, we we get so confused with, well, gosh, that's selfish. I can't do that. I can't take care of myself first. Everybody needs me. My kids need me. My mom needs me. No, we need to fuel ourselves and balance ourselves first in terms of this energetic field so that I can contain and hold a higher frequency of love. Because when we're not doing it that way and we're transferring, it's done in fear. So again, when we talk vehicle, gas, and tank, there's two kinds of vehicle. One is done in love, one is done in fear. And most of us, when we are empathing, are working in fear. Because again, what will it trigger? I'm not safe. I'm not enough. I don't have enough worth. So I'm going to prove and I'm going to prove and I'm going to prove. And I keep going and going just like that little energizer bunny that we're so scared to fall over when our battery wears out, but it will happen. It did to me. So that's why I wrote this. (laughs) (laughs) That's why a lot of people burn out and then wonder, why did I burn out? What was happening? Well, and I thought I was being wonderful. I mean, I'm very honest in this book. You know, uh, this is my second book. And I told way more stories in this book about my honest, you know, mistakes. I didn't know. I thought I was being wonderful and fabulous by taking care of everybody and everything and being the control freak of the world. I really, really felt like I was getting somewhere in life. And in reality, it was just a sham and I was dying inside. And I I literally write in that book how I felt like that little pink bunny and I was terrified to fall over. And the day I did, it was probably the best thing that happened to me. Hard, but good. (laughs) Well, in the beginning of our discussion, you talked about how you empath places and nature. What does that look like? Yeah, this is a this is an interesting one because I had not found much information out there in the world regarding this. And this is very common, especially for my sensitive clients. Um, oftentimes it can be, let's use, let's use the ocean. For example, many people love the ocean and they feel like, oh gosh, I want to go and have a vacation by the ocean. And yet they may come down to the ocean and for a minute there, they're, oh gosh, this is great. And then all of a sudden the sense of foreboding or sense of sadness or a sense of disconnect can come over them. And if they're not educated or even have context, they don't stop and do the discernment questions. Like I break out in the book, like, Hey, wait, is this sadness even mine? Is this foreboding even mine right now? And if we don't discern that question and we don't break it down immediately, the human brain is so determined to make sense of things that I will create it to be mine within the next 48 hours. I will take foreboding or sadness 
and bring it into my life, which indeed was nothing to do with anything other than that sensitive empath was feeling the sadness of the water, the sadness of the fish, the sadness of pollution, the sadness of the coral reefs, et cetera, because these are all bodies of consciousness that emanate their frequency and vibration out. And if that gas tank is open, I'm going to take that just as much as I would take that crabby boss or that mean mother-in-law, right? I mean, it's all the same stuff. It's just different packages. So looking at the ocean and that those feelings and sadness that's there, and, and I'm not saying that everyone feels that when they're at the ocean, but let's say right. we, we right. get there and that's, that's there. Is there something that we can do to help and benefit that? Are we, are we supposed to help to transmute any of that? Or is that yeah. something that the ocean takes care of on its own? Actually, you, you said the key word right there, transmute. We are designed to be transmuters of this planetary system. We are in partnership and relationship with this earth because we picked it. And I have the capability, if I'm confident and trained, to go, oh, gosh, this is the ocean is sad. I'm going to feel that sad ocean, but I'm going to disconnect it from myself and I'm going to send it back to source. And we can do that in a number of ways. And I get really detailed in the latter part of the book on how to do that. We can pray it through. We can use a cloud. We can use the waves. We can use anything we want to because this is where creativity comes in and individuality. And so we're getting that sad back to source. So why do we want to put that back to source? Because in between lives, when new incarnations are coming in and they're determining their path and their goals down here, quite possibly that new incarnation being is going to be the one that says, oh my goodness, this is what we've done to our oceans. And then they indeed, in when they're incarnated as human, become that scientist that cleans up the oceans. We need to get the information back to the library of source so that the new beings coming in can evolve us forward in love instead of spin us in the same place in fear. And it gives us some personal responsibility when it comes to being able to be accountable and be present and and be part of this world as, as opposed to thinking we're separate from it. Exactly. Because when the empath starts to understand how to do it skilled, we become empathic. And most of us are not as empathic and compassionate as we could be. And I'm not usually saying the word should, but I may even hear say should be in terms of connection, oneness, right? I mean, this is what we're here for is to remember that we're all one. And this igniting of empathy, meaning I can feel that ocean, this can understand then if I can feel the ocean, I can feel my brother or sister on this planet. So it's, it's important for us to get, go bigger with all of this. And again, you made a really good point. Not everybody feels the ocean. You might feel a collective consciousness. You might feel sadness when you're watching the news. You might feel the animal kingdom. You might feel literal land that you built your home on that you're not aware of that had a tragedy and so on. So these are unseen worlds of energy. And it's hard because not everyone even thinks twice about, gosh, maybe I'm feeling the ocean or maybe I'm feeling the news. You know, so it's it's a difficult world until we start to open our eyes to it all. In your book, you talk about practicing discernment. And I'd love for you to share about that with our listeners. Yeah, that is the very, very, very first step is, is this mine? And I am not even joking. I do this all day long. And I, I believe I even write in this particular book about a time when I was simply driving to a class that I was teaching and I quite simply drove down a road and felt this wave of sadness. And the very first thing that I've trained myself to do is say, is this mine? Is this mine? And the first answer in my head was absolutely not. And then I keep asking the questions and I identify those boundaries and I scan my own body. So these are the kind of the practices. It's asking, is it mine? Identifying the boundary. Did I just drive through it? Is it still with me? Is it gone? You know, noticing triggers. What happened in my body? Where did I feel that if I scan my body? So in this particular case, I drove through an intersection, which later I psychically pieced together that a young woman had been killed in this intersection in a traffic accident. And her essence and her sad and her fear was still embedded in that actual physicality of the intersection. Now, if nobody has any context to that, all we do is drive through sad and scared and loss and grief. And I go home and I transfer that. And then that can really input on your existence <laughs> and the rest yeah. of your you know, the, the rest of your day and what's going to happen going afterwards. 
And boy, oh boy, will it be confusing because if I'm feeling like I don't trust something or I've lost something or I'm sad about something and I bring that home to my partner or my child or my workspace, my logical brain is going to try to put that round peg into the square hole and go, I don't understand what I'm sad about, but I'm going to shove it in there to make sense of it somehow, some way, and I'm going to maneuver and manipulate. And oftentimes I'm now transferring that energy that has nothing to do with anything. And it's really detrimental to us. So the more skilled we can get in discernment, and I'm not joking, I walk through my day constantly saying, is that mine? Why did I create that? What did I do? Why am I bringing that in? What do I want to do with that? And that's how we stay present in our humanness. Such good advice. I've heard of people going to Gettysburg and just being overcome with grief. (laughs) Yes. At places like that, or Pearl Harbor, places where there's been such a great loss of life, uh, you know, the 9-11 memorial. Yeah, and, and, and you think you're on vacation, right? I mean, you're like, wee, wee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that 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 could be extremely difficult. And you hear people not really understanding sometimes, like they leave feeling just just like, of course, these places impact us because of what has happened there, but yes. maybe sometimes not in the way that's that's positive for them for moving forward. Not at all. And, you know, I way back when I started this, I wrote in this actual book that I was at um, the, uh, what is it in Paris? I was at the Bastille when we were doing where they cut the people's heads off and I couldn't figure out where my neck, my neck was hurting. And I'm rubbing my shoulders and I didn't know where I was because I was ignorant to the tour. And by the time we got to the back, I'm like, I feel like my neck is being cracked. And then all of a sudden they started to explain where we were. And I'm like, oh, for goodness sake, Suzanne, you're just feeling all of this, you know, horror from years and years and years and years ago. And it's embedded into the stones and into the land. And then they make a tour out of it, you know? So it's, it's really hard on the sensitive person. It's very, very difficult. And again, maybe the general person doesn't recognize that, but boy, that sensitive one will. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. Is there a practice that our listeners can use? Let's say if they're going into a place that could hold a lot of heavy energy, like maybe like a nursing home or a hospital or, or you, it's like you, you name it, yes. that they yes. could use to help protect themselves? And the appendix carries all of the meditations, the practicums, the breakdowns, but in, in a short summary of it, I did hospice and still do, but did it many, many years, for many, many years. I do a lot of chopping with my hands. I cut cords. I ground and bubble myself. When I left hospice, I would open all the windows to my car and just rush the, you know, the air through no matter what the time of year was, even in Minnesota. Um, You know, I would do anything and everything to just rebalance and reground myself. And I would look very Italian while talking when I was leaving because I would just use my hands as expression. But in essence, I was really cutting all my cords. So we can do this very privately without anyone even knowing we're doing anything. And or we can just do it in a very practiced, skillful way. So these are all recorded in the book, but grounding, bubbling, cutting cords, you know, letting things go, practicing body scanning. Those are all huge for an empath. So where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your book and be part of your community? Yeah. Thank you for asking. It's just basically my name. So it's sworthly.com. So S-W-O-R-T-H-L-E-Y.com. And it has, um, My first book, which was called Energy Healer's Book of Dying, which is an excellent book in terms of how we die energetically. That is um, a very special book to me. I wrote that while doing hospice. So that's available on there and Amazon as well. You can find The Confident Empath just about anywhere online if you just Google it, but you can also go to my site. And then my site shows all of the other work I do and tons of free materials, including the ground and bubble technique. It's a free download on my website. Well, Suzanne, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. I really appreciate the forum to be able to get the information out because it's really pertinent right now and very important. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Suzanne. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Confident Empath, a complete guide to multidimensional empathing and energetic protection. Confident Empath is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And remember, support our indie bookstores. Go to your local bookstore, make sure to order it if it's not on the shelf. You can also purchase this book directly from the publisher, Inner Traditions, at innertraditions.com. 
Moments with Marianne is heard in over a hundred countries, and we'd like to thank our listeners from New Zealand, Denmark, Malta, Ukraine, Japan, Philippines, United Kingdom, and many more. We appreciate you tuning in and look forward to your comments and suggestions. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Mary Ann, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.